God is good. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, I want us to open our Bibles to the book of Joshua. Today I'm going to be speaking about waging a good warfare. Waging a good warfare. And if we open the book of uh, Joshua and we start in chapter 1, um, the Bible says, I want to read from verse, um, uh, verse 6. And um, let's start in verse 5. God is making a promise to Joshua who has just succeeded Moses. And he says to him in verse 5, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. And as I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and be of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to the, their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to the law which Moses my servant gave to you and do not turn from it to the left hand or to the right and that you may prosper wherever you go and this book of the law do not depart do not let it depart from your mouth but you shall meditate on it day and night and you shall observe to do according to all that is written in it and for you will make your way prosperous in this way and then you will have good success. Amen? Amen. 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 Last week, Pastor Munez spoke to us and he launched the theme uh, for this year as a, as a church and it is called the Joshua Generation Hashtag Taking Territory. And he went on to explain to us that this is a year we are believing God is going to add territory to us. Amen? And you remember that the components of that were going to be sonship, we're going to be discipleship, and we're going to be ministry. Do you remember that? That we have to treat ourselves or to see ourselves or allow ourselves to manifest as sons uh, this year. And sonship has to do with responsibility. Sonship has to do with taking our position. Sonship has to do with making sacrifices to see that the household of the father is established. Amen. Amen. And then discipleship has to do with us training ourselves, agreeing to come into cell groups, to, uh, to, to work in accountability, uh, to, to be trained in every possible way so that we become disciples and become more like Christ. And ministry was that we would be outward looking, reaching out to the lost, either one-on-one -on -one or in outreaches or in any way, but to make sure that the number that are coming into the house of God is being increased. You remember that? And that is what we are working with right through this year. And territory must be repossessed. Amen. Yes. I think you're, you're sounding a little bit weak this morning. And I think it's from the fasting. Let me just say, is, is that's what it is, is it? No. It's from the prayer and fasting and your bodies are feeling a little bit feeble. Say to your neighbor, I am looking for something. I am looking for something. And I know I will find it. I know I'm going to find it. I am going to find it in Jesus' name. Amen. Joshua chapter 13 uh, starts in verse 1 and says, Now Joshua was old and advanced in years, and the Lord said to him, You are old and advanced in years, and there remains much land yet to be possessed. And this is the land that yet remains. And go, God goes to say which land uh, was still outstanding and it needed to be reassigned or needed to be given to the children of Israel. But you can imagine that Moses had territory that he took. Joshua comes on and God still says there's territory to be taken. And when Joshua is getting old, God still says there's territory to be taken. So each generation has got territory that they must possess. Amen? Each generation has, and says... Mo Joshua, you've done so well, you're about to retire, but there remains much territory, and this is what remains to be taken. And pastor said to us, this is, we are the Joshua generation, taking territory, hashtag, is what we are working with this year. And I just wanted to say to you, that you too have territory that you must possess, but that territory is primarily spiritual territory that will manifest physically. Amen. There is physical territory, no doubt about that. There is things that we didn't own or didn't possess or that we were not in charge of that we are physically going to be in charge of. 
But the primary preoccupation, the primary focus should be on us dispossessing spiritual territory that is in the wrong hands, spiritual hands right now, so that it comes into the right spiritual hands. And when it is in the right spiritual hands, it will have its full physical manifestation. Amen. Amen. That's why it is so important that none of us are left out in this period of prayer and fasting. Our prayer and fasting here is to insist on God to give us a strategy of how we can change the spiritual atmosphere of our physical circumstances. Jesus said, I don't want you to pray in verbose language and in lots of long prayers as people that don't understand. I said, when you pray, pray saying this, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven, that God has got an accomplished will up in heaven that our prayer and fasting, our obedience of his word is going to cause it to manifest here. It's not voting in an election. It's not joining a group. It's not starting a movement that is going to make the counsel of God or the will of God be manifest. It is spiritual engagement that is going to cause an alignment in heaven so that we see what we need here on earth. Amen? Amen. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Now I want to say something to you and I want you to really listen to. We are in a period of prayer and fasting. The numbers that have been coming to prayer and fasting are not representative of the magnitude of the situation that is facing us. Yes. Amen. Yes. The number of people that have understood that we must consecrate ourselves until the end of the month is not enough. Yeah. That's true. Amen. I know we have a fuel crisis. I know we have these situations, but there's a certain rising above the circumstances that we must do so that God would give us. We must sacrifice so that God would respond to us. And I loved what Pastor Baker said when he said that, you know, he hasn't had to be in a queue uh, 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 while this whole thing has been. We must, you must believe God this year, this week for 70 liters so that you can attend prayer and fasting. Painless 70 liters. Who believes that? Raise your hand. Father, your people want to pray. Your people want to come together. Your people want to respond to the call that you have made. And I pray that you would respond to them and make it possible for them to come into prayer and fasting with the others in Jesus' name. Amen. Because there is a physical thing that we do here that has got a spiritual significance. Praying and fasting is one of those things. Now, you remember in the book of Exodus, chapter 17, and I really want us to understand this, that God is a very prescriptive God. So when we first come to God, we treat him general terms, in a general way. We just pray when it's time to eat. We pray when it's time to go to sleep. But when God is giving us territory, he is very prescriptive of how that territory must be taken. And you hear him saying to Moses as they're fighting the Amalekites, Moses says, God has spoken to me. I'm going to go on top on the hill and I'm going to hold the staff of the Lord. And as he's holding the staff of the Lord, he realizes that every time physically that he raises his hands, Israel is prevailing. And every time his hands go down, Amalek is prevailing. And so he gets Aaron and her to come and help him so that he maintains this posture that God is responding to. Amen? Now I want you to understand that there is uh, things that we do in the physical when instructed by God that provoke something in the spiritual. The Bible says in Psalm 47, clap your hands, all you people, shout to God with a sound of triumph. Amen? Why? I don't understand what clapping our hands does in the atmosphere, but God commands it and it is prescriptive in certain things so that it provokes a certain spiritual response. Amen? We as Africans understand this very clearly. When I'm greeting someone, I don't even have to say anything. If I say this, they understand that I'm honoring them. Just by the clapping of my hands. I don't know what it does in the atmosphere. I don't know what it does in the spirit, but it does something. 
It says, shout to God with a voice of triumph. I don't know what shouting signifies in the atmosphere except that it brings down strongholds because he said to the children of Jericho, of of Israel, go around Jericho seven times quietly and on the seventh time, I want you to give a shout. So if the children of Israel had walked around quietly or had walked around speaking with a low voice, with monotones, they would not be able to achieve. So I don't understand. God is called a God of hosts. I don't understand what in the formation of heaven requires sometimes that I clap, requires sometimes that I raise my hands, requires sometimes that I shout. And Paul says, for this reason, I bend my knee before the Lord. There are times that we are supposed to Understand what is going on and bending our knee is the thing that is going to elicit the correct response from God. It is no longer the time for gentlemen. It is no longer the time for I am the conservative kind. I don't clap in church. I don't raise my hands. I don't shout. No. There's a spiritual arrangement that needs to be provoked by our obedience. Amen. Amen. You remember when God said, I'm going to destroy Israel. And, and Moses said, you can't do that. What does the Bible say? It says, for 40 days, I lay down prostrate before the Lord. And each time I prostrated myself and pleaded with God and said, God, do not destroy these people. It's not like, God, now I realize that you want to destroy these people. And it's my, um, my thinking that uh, uh, if we just, uh, I, I don't know, Lord, I, it, you might just um, sort something out. The Bible says Moses went like this. And lay before God, prostrated, because that prescription was invoking a certain response from heaven that preserved the children of Israel. God says, pray and fast for 21 days. Deny yourself food. Come and join the others in praying. Raise your hands. Clap to God. Bend the knee. You know, the Bible says that every knee. There's going to be a day when we behold Jesus. It says God has given him a name because he agreed to dying for us and even death on a cross. And he did not consider equality with God something to be held on to. He says, so God has given him a name that is above all names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Amen. Amen. So there's going to come a day where involuntarily or voluntarily, it is impossible to be in his presence and remain upstanding. It says that every knee shall bow. So if God is asking you now to bend the knee, you don't have an understanding. I don't. But it means something. Maybe this is the utmost and, 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 and practice and demonstration that I'm willing now to bow to Christ so that his name is exalted as I will when I behold him face to face. We have to come to prayer. This is not a Martin Daisy Utanga Kwegore. No, this is about the mandate that God has given us to possess territory and it is being prepared for and the foundation is being laid for by coming to pray and fast. Amen. Paul says, I beat my body into submission. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He says, I, I, please put it there, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. He says, this body of mine, I, I, I don't let it behave anyhow. I don't cause it to, to refuse to raise hands when it must. I don't cause it to refuse to fall. He says, the, I beat my own body into submission. It says, in, in, in King James, it says, I make my body my slave. Did you find it? I can, I can find it quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 
It is so important because he goes on to say, present your bodies, Romans chapter 12, as a living sacrifice. This is your worship, your act of worship to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one person receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may be that person. I'm paraphrasing. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we do it for an unperishable crown. Therefore, I run not with uncertainty. I fight not as the one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I've preached to everyone else, I might miss the mark. Paul says we have to come into the habit of subduing our body, of quieting its passions so that I get a, an imperishable crown. I must run like the one who, I must win the race. Yes. Amen. Yes. And that's why he says, present your bodies yeah. as a living sacrifice. As a living, this body must not rule us. We must beat it into submission because we have a crown. You must raise your hands. You must clap. You must dance before the Lord. You must when he prescribes. Because there's something that is happening in the atmosphere that requires us down here to perform in a certain way so that that thing is made manifest to us. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 18. Remember we're talking about fighting a good warfare. Fighting a good warfare. 1 Timothy chapter 1. This is Paul talking to Timothy. Remember two weeks ago we spoke about though the promises of God be many, yet in Christ Jesus they shall all be yes and amen. Yes and amen. God doesn't care how many promises he has made, but every single one of them he has the capacity to fulfill and cause it to be yes and amen in the next year. Can I take my jacket off? So Paul says, this charge I commit to you, my son Timothy, according to the promise, prophecies previously made concern you, that by them you may wage a good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, with some have, which some have rejected concerning the faith and have suffered a shipwreck, of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So God is saying, Paul is saying to his son, Take the promises that God has made you. And says, with them, wage a good warfare. Don't just say, God promised that Zimbabwe would be the, the, the bread basket of Africa. That is so nice. Don't say that God said, by this time next year, I will have circumstances change. That's so nice. Don't say, God has said that my children shall thrive. That's so nice. That I'm going to get married to a, man, a, godly, a godly man or a godly woman. That's so nice. No, when you have received that promise, wage a good warfare with faith. Amen. Amen. And so it says, enumerate the promises that God has made to you and use those to wage a good warfare. Yeah. Many, many years ago, 2007, to be precise, we were at a prayer meeting, uh, an all-night prayer meeting in South Africa, and a man who was speaking says, I, I see you, I see the favor of God upon your life, and says, God has said that he will always give you favor with embassies, with, uh, um, he said, with airlines, borders, embassies, and I can't remember the other thing that he said, but it had to do with inter-border uh, transfers and, and, uh, and, and movement. And, and, and it was nice, but I wrote it down. But every single time that I have gone to apply for a visa, I've quoted that to God. And God has always responded. Last year, my wife dropped her passport at the airport by mistake, and she was not allowed to continue with the rest of her journey. And she was stuck in an airport. 
and they, could, they didn't want to go and fetch the passport where she thought she had dropped it because it was now on the other side of the security boundary. You know? And I was here, and she was in America. And I got on my knees, and I said, Lord, you said we would always have favor with airline, with borders, with customs, with immigration and embassies. And before long, that whole situation was reversed. But you have to wage a good warfare. Yes. Amen? Some of you, God has said, your children will come by way of miracle. Your home will come by way of miracle. Or you will be the, 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 the light in your family. Wage a good warfare. Yes. Yes. Wage a good warfare. Yes. With that word. That's right. And if you haven't received that kind of a word, go and find the word that God has put in there. He says, I'll never leave you forsake or forsake you. He says, the lions grow weary and hungry, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. Now you say, Lord, today my children yes. don't seem to have any bread and may wage a good warfare. Yes. With that. Amen? Though the promises of God be many, in Christ Jesus they shall be yes and amen. So we say that God's promises are true, we said every person has been given a measure of faith to start your journey with and it is directly proportional to the calling of God upon your life. It's up to you how you develop it so that it keeps accomplishing what God has asked to do, right? And the thing that the devil is after for all of us is our faith. Is our faith. The Bible says that uh, Peter in Luke chapter 22 comes before the Lord Jesus and he's being prepared for his assignment. And he says, Jesus says, Peter, Peter, the devil has asked for you, has sought to sift you as wheat. Satan, and Jesus says, but I have prayed for you. Not that, you, not that you don't go through what you're about to go through. He says, but I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. I've prayed for you that when you see the circumstance that is surrounding you, your faith does not fail. When you hear the announcements on TV, your faith does not fail. When you look around and see what's happening, your faith does not fail. Jesus did not say, Peter... I have prayed that you don't go through what the devil is about to put you. He said, no, I have prayed for you that you would remain steady through it and that your faith may not fail. And he says, and when you have overcome, that you would strengthen your brethren. So we as Zimbabweans, you as a family, you as a person are supposed to be rocked, yes, but when you have survived the rocking, you are supposed to be a dispenser of help in the area that you have been most afflicted in. Amen. Before long, a time is going to come when nations will be coming to Zimbabwe and to be taught about hyperinflation, to be taught about resuscitating a healthcare system, to be taught about propping up an efficient civil service. They are going to learn from us. But that doesn't happen by us joining a party. That doesn't happen by us joining a trade union. It, it happens by us understanding God and going before God with all manner of attitudes and seeking God to intervene in our circumstances. And he has prayed that our faith would not fail. And when we are, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways that we don't see, but God will make a way. Amen. Amen. He says, I'm not going to leave you, nor forsake you. The devil is after your faith. That's why Dr. Chimbiti to say, I pray, increase my faith. Support my faith. Help me, help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. I don't know who you are. Just raise your hand. You know that there's a rocking that's been planned, or you are in the middle of that rocking right now. And I pray for you. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, so I know that Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those that are in distress because he liveth to make intercession for us. 
I'm asking that the Lord Jesus would pray for your rocking in the name of Jesus. That the Lord Jesus himself would, please put that Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25. I want us to read it together. I want us to read it together. Amen. You must come to prayer. You must come to prayer. You must come to prayer. You must participate in prayer. You must fast this season. You have to. You have to. The Bible says, Hebrews 7, 25. Let's read it together. Therefore, he, read it out loud. Therefore, he is also able to save those to the uttermost, those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Guys, it's one thing, Pastor Mnyeza praying for you, Dr. Wazara praying for you. It's another thing, Pastor PK praying for you. It's a completely different ball game. When Jesus, standing at the right hand of the Father, says, my Lord, regarding the rocking of your son in Zimbabwe, I pray now that you'd prop him up. I pray that you'd give him victory. I pray that his faith would not fail. I pray that when he comes out, he'd be seven times the man that he was right now. It's a whole different ball game. But we have to understand these scriptures that Jesus is making intercession for us. Those that have come to him. Amen. Remember we said to watch out for the enemies of our promises, which were lethargy, which were doubt, which were fear, which were unwillingness to change, and was unforgiveness. Remember that? And I, I, we wrote them down, and we're praying all the time that God don't make me be fearful, don't let me be unforgiving, don't let me be unwilling to change. When you hear a promise, write this down. You must hear it. You must believe it. You must claim it. You must contend for it. You must build faith around it and then possess it. You hear the promise of God. You have to believe that it's from God. Amen? And you have to believe that it can be effective in your life. So you, you hear it, you believe it. To claim is not, oh, I claim this guy, I claim this house. No, it's to say there has been a gap in my life that has been painful and not God-ordained. I hear this thing that God has said, and they match. This thing will plug this hole. That's why I claim it, and my father has spoken it. So you claim something that God has done for another person, that God has promised in his word, or something that God has promised to you. Amen? You just claim an example of God's working in that area over your life. That's how we treat people in hospitals. We have observed Queen Nina to work in certain situations of malaria. And so when someone else comes with malaria, we have confidence that we can take that Queen Nina and it is likely to work. And so I don't go and look for something else. I look for something that has been tried. And the word of God, what God has done, I read for you that week, that he has written these things as examples for us now that we would, our faith would be ratcheted up. Amen. So, you know, God, I'm talking about prayer and fasting and our warfare. And I want you to understand that God has defeated Satan. Do you understand? The ultimate battle with the enemy of our soul is done. Amen? And ours is to enforce what he has said in our lives. See, so the policeman is not coming to you and say, I am thinking, I saw you stealing now. Let me see uh, what stealing. Uh, is that a good thing? Let me just, before I... Are, he has already a book of rules that say in the constitution of Zimbabwe under the law of the land, stealing is illegal. He simply has to enforce. Amen? So God, see the Bible... I want to read this to you. Go to Colossians chapter 2. Very, very important. Verse 15. 
I don't know if I'm working with anyone. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. Understand this. This is talking about Jesus. So, so you understand that when Jesus was born, the, the devil knew that there was a savior being born. He wasn't quite sure which one he was. And then come the three wise men, they make an announcement that uh, the Savior has been born. And so he understands, ah, the Savior has been born. Then he goes killing everyone who's under the age of, all the boys who are the under age of two or three, right? Thinking that he has wiped out Jesus. And then Jesus emerges at age 12, beginning to do the work of his father. Jesus emerges again at age 30, and the devil says, no, no, that guy is still around. And he, he goes, he takes him to the, to the wilderness to try him. And he tries him and tries to offer Jesus to refuse his position in God and says, if you would just, and I told you, if you would just bend your knee and worship me, I will give you all of this. And Jesus refuses and Satan realizes that he has a problem on his hands. Amen. Because he had not read the scriptures fully that his kingdom shall have no end. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. And so he, when Jesus is finally, Satan goes and infiltrates Judas and causes all those guys to condemn Christ and Christ is, is nailed to the cross and Christ dies. Right? Yeah. When Christ dies, the yeah. devil says, we've done it. And the Bible says, where does Christ go for those three days? He goes to hell, to Hades. That's why he came up with the key. Amen. So Christ goes to hell. And in hell, Jesus brings all, the, Satan brings all the demons. The demon of poverty, the demon of HIV, the demon of cancer, the demon of oppression, of dictatorship. Every single demon comes. And they hold on. Stand up, Pastor Ndu. And these demons hold on to Jesus in hell. Says, you're not going anywhere. And so Jesus has no help. Do you realize Jesus didn't go with the Holy Spirit down there? He had no help. And so it's just, you may sit down, Pastor. I just wanted to show them. And Jesus wrestles every single demon. Yes. And there is a spectacle. Everyone is watching. And he asked, they say, hey, in comes uh, the demon of racism. And Jesus deals with it. And in comes the demon of matrimonial failure. And here comes the demon of barrenness. The demon of sickness and disease. The demon of uh, uh, witchcraft. Every single one of them comes. And listen to what the word says. If I can get this thing back. Maybe I'm supposed to not move. I need help. Where's that gentleman that helps me? I think I got it. Have I? Can you hear me? Verse 15. So important that you understand this. And it says, and you, verse 13, Colossians, being dead in your trespasses, which is what we were, and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together. He has made you alive together with him, having, number one, forgiven you all your trespasses. Number two, having wiped out the right thing that was against you. So there were consequences that were supposed to follow your sinful nature. It says, Jesus wiped away the handwriting of requirements that was against us and which were contrary to us. And having taken it out of the way and having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed what? Because the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, we war not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, rulers of this dark age, and the evil forces in the heavenlies, right? And it says Jesus, having wrestled every principality and power, he was in a contest with each one. He disarmed them. And he made a public spectacle of them. I want you to understand that Jesus overcame. There is no longer a battle between Jesus and these items. The 
imagery here, if you go, Bible scholars, there is a uh, ceremony that was in Rome called the Triumphus, the Triumph Ceremony. The Triumphus was of an army general that came back from a foreign war. And then he would be paraded in front of people sitting in a theater to show here comes the triumphant general. But it was not just him that was being paraded. Every single item of loot that he had acquired would be in a four horse carriage behind him being drawn so that the people would not only realize that he was victorious, but that he also brought some things. And that wasn't the end of the ceremony. They would also have all those that survived but had become subdued as his captives with chains round their neck and they would be paraded and walking. And so he could say, that was the general of this country. That was the, his vice commander. That was his this and that. That was his this and that. And they would be paraded. And he says, Jesus made a spectacle of everything. So what I am saying painstakingly is that the, 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 the situation now, the verdict remains with us. Because the enemy has been defeated. And so God, how obedient. You see, the, the love of God is unconditional. But the favor of God is proportional to your obedience, stewardship, and sacrifice. The favor of God, he said, no good thing will he withhold from him whose walk is upright. He has surrounded you with favor as a shield. He made Jesus grow in stature, in favor with God and in favor with man because he was obedient to God. And God wants us to be obedient to him so that we can have favor. You see, God... These angelic forces, who the Bible says in Hebrews are ministers to us, who are supposed to bring us goods and are supposed to, to intervene for us. All the, the demonic forces are there thinking they can do something. The angelic forces are there waiting for the instruction of God. And our obedience causes the battle to swing in our favor. That's why you must pray. That's why you must fast and cause the swing. To move. Man, there's so much that we must cover. But I have to select what? The Bible says that, remember I said that you, 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 you hear it, you claim it, you contend for it. Contend for it means even though it looks contrary to what you have been promised. You don't give up. And that's why I say we build faith builders. I call them prophetic uh, acts. So, so for three weeks last year, the Lord had me wear two watches. For me, 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 me. Well, I don't even know if it's the Lord, but it was a prophet. He said to me, I'm moving you from a new old season to a new season. So I had an old watch on this side and a new watch on this side. And guess what? Every time I wore a short sleeved shirt, why are you wearing two watches? That's what people say. And it reminded me, I'm moving from here to here. And I, even if I still looked like I was still here, but because I had these things, they reminded me. Amen? And so you must have faith, Bill. You must have your own prophetic things that you do. So I had a man phone me on my birthday. Oh, yeah. Hey, Pastor Piquet, I also had a birthday on 5 January. Guys. And uh, I... Uh, no, no. Huh? Did you pray for me? Was I here? Oh, but did you say what you said about Pastor Piquet, may the Lord... And, you know, I've told you guys that God speaks to me through cars. I told you. And the man said, oh, I have an, a house that I'm putting a tenant in and I'm clearing the, the yard. I said, yes. He says, I've, I've got this shell of a car that's been there. Do you want it? 
And, um, and, and God spoke to me. And he said, I'm remembering you on your birthday, number one. But the car had no engine and no gearbox. It was. And, and he says, I know, this is the man says, I know you. Before long, you will have found what to put in that car. And I heard the spirit of God say, even if you are handed a shell, my action upon your life is going to enable you to fill a vessel that is given to you empty. So that was a prophetic thing. When I see that car, I don't see a shell. I see God building me up to fill it. But you have to do that for your own life. God says that you must be restless in, in Genesis chapter 27. He said to, 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 to Esau when he said, he says, I've put your brother over you. But when you really, really decide to protest, his weight off your shoulders is going to come. Right. Amen? So God is urging persistence and diligence. Push, pray until something happens. Galatians says, do not become weary. Galatians chapter 6, don't become weary in doing good because you will reap a reward if you faint not, if you don't give up. He says in Luke chapter 18, he says, Jesus told them this parable that men ought always to pray and not give up. You are supposed to pray your marriage through. You are supposed to pray your education through. You are supposed to pray your project. Don't have, I pray for anyone who's got a God-given project that is still uncompleted right now, that God in this year would give you the ability to complete. Uh, that you must see your fatherhood through, your, your childhood through. Every single thing, you must pray it until you see the manifestation. And as long as the manifestation has not happened, because you understand... That in the atmosphere, it was done. It's only my obedience, my profession of faith, and my conduct that is going to cause the favor of God to swing the battle and the victory to become apparent in my life. Amen? Amen. The Lord will preach the remainder of the... the, I know that. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 17. Verse 14. I told you that I found uh, the actual mustard seeds. So I found out now that you just put them between two uh, uh, tissues and put moisture until they germinate. Then you take and you transplant them into... I have thousands of them. So, so this time I'm not giving any of you seeds. When they germinate, I'll give you trees. <laughs> Amen? And plant a mustard seed for your business. Plant a mustard seed. It's not a hoo hoo It's just when you see that thing growing, say, my faith must grow like this. And I can't wait to see the birds come. I put it in a way, because the Bible says it's the smallest of seeds, and it is. It says, but when it, uh, when it, is, it becomes the biggest of all shrubs, and the birds come to nest. In my, uh, in my not that one, uh, doves. Christians. <laughs> so, verse 14. And when they had come to the multitude, the man came to him, kneeling down and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples that they could not cure him. Then Jesus said, Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. And the disciples then came behind the scenes and said, Why could we not cast it out? And Jesus said, It's because of your unbelief. For I surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except through prayer and fasting. I'm just going to humbly submit to you that 
if you are not praying and fasting, there remain some things in your life that don't move. There are some things that are only moved by the prescription of a tablet of prayer and a tablet of fasting going into the person at the same time. And Jesus says, it's faith that does it. But anyway, on top of faith, this kind only comes out with prayer and fasting. Amen? Amen. And there's some things that have been staring at you in the notice medical people how Christ diagnoses sickness and disease. I want to stay up here. How Christ diagnoses sickness and disease. He doesn't say this uh, uh, hereditary genetic uh, pre- dominant uh, 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 disease uh, called epilepsy that runs in families. Uh, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat it. He says this demon. Yeah. Do you understand? Yeah. This de- they come and say he's got epilepsy. Jesus says he's got a demon. Amen? And it's important. In, 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 uh, in, uh, in Matthew chapter 13, or Luke chapter 13, Luke chapter 13, verse 4, thereabouts, Luke, who was a doctor, talks about a woman who's healed on the Sabbath. She comes, according to us, she had osteoarthritis and osteoporosis because the Bible says she was bent like this and couldn't straighten up. And he heals her on the Sabbath. And people say, why do you do surgery on the Sabbath? Why do you lay hands on the Sabbath? Couldn't you have found another? And Jesus says, this daughter of Abraham, that the devil has kept bound these 18 years, would you not heal? If you will take your cow out of a well on a Sabbath, would you not heal someone who has been bound of the devil? He says, woman, thou art loosed. Amen. Amen. And he makes... so. I just want to present to you that when we say chronic diseases, this is simply the manifestation of an affliction that needs to be dealt with in the spirit as well. Amen? When we say hereditary essential hypertension, that is the manifestation, but there is a root cause. If we went to Jesus with the files and the documents that the high blood pressure was there, Jesus would say, I see it. The woman is bent. I understand. He says, but woman, thou art loosed. And there's some of us here, it's been 18 years. And today, the Holy Spirit wants to loose you. The Holy Spirit wants to loose you. The Holy Spirit wants to lose you. Or maybe it's been 38 years. But God still wants to deal with it. We have to pray and fast. And this year, we have to reverse the foundation of every one of our afflictions. We war not Ephesians chapter 6 against flesh and blood. But I want to show you that. And I think we, ha- we will have to stop there. Ephesians chapter 6. I'll have to stop there. But I want you to understand this. I want you to understand it with everything that you have. Because Satan has, has kept us in the dark. And yet, God has given us the light. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord. Verse 10. And in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. So whoever is troubling you, that's not where it is primarily. He says, but against principalities and powers. You remember, I said in Colossians, he, over, he said he disarmed principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this age and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Let me just tell you that this is a graduation of the power of darkness that is being explained there. Principalities, weakest, followed by powers, followed by rulers of darkness and then the territorial ones. I want you to understand that. 
that there's a hierarchy. That's why Mapostor Ringanga uh, uh, and all those kind of people can appear to remove demons. Do you understand? It's only that they replace a small one with a bigger one. So principalities and powers usually have to do with personal affliction. So sickness and disease, lack, that's principalities and power. But this is first grade in demonology. Right? And this is what Jesus said, this kind cometh out by prayer and fasting. That's why you must pray and you must fast. Then it says that rulers of darkness, rulers of darkness are institutional demons. They are bigger. They usually work through a person who has given himself to them. So dictators, tyrants, those kind of people, Hitler, this, that kind of a spirit, it's a ruler of darkness and its objective is to subdue a community. Right? Some fathers are rulers of darkness. Some boyfriends are rulers of darkness. They instill fear that cause the institution that is the family to not progress. Esther fasted against a ruler of darkness. You remember? Yeah. Who wanted to annihilate the Jews. There is principalities and powers. That's where it starts. But there's rulers of darkness. Daniel had to deal with the greatest one. Which is the one over a territory, the prince of, Asia, of Persia, that comes to say a nation must not have its own currency. A nation cannot progress. A nation cannot prosper. These are not, you don't beat that by joining a party. You beat that by strategically inquiring of God that is it a 21-day fast that is required to change the prince of Zimbabwe. Are you with me? So don't be fooled. No, 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 no. They just replaced a principality with a power or a power and promised that child to become a ruler of darkness later. But we must have strategy. We must have strategy. We must have strategy. We must have strategy. That strategy only comes by prayer and fasting and inquiring before God and not dealing with each problem the same way that we have dealt with it before. My God. We must pray. Because the thing that you're walking through right now, you're not sure if it's just a principality, you're not sure if it's a power, you're not sure if it's a ruler of darkness. You know, uh, guys, the, 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 am I, am I done? The, the, the Bible says, you see, rulers of darkness um, are these people that, that, that make rules for others, Right? Mammon, the spirit of Mammon, spoken of in Luke chapter 16, is a ruler of the controlling the financial sector. Do you understand? And Mammon does not want to see Christian businesses thrive. Number one. Mammon does not want giving to God. That's why you struggle so much to tithe. It's not just because you are mathematically astute or you're trying to do accounting. There is a demon that supervises. Because when you are prosperous as a business person, you are supposed to fund the gospel. You are supposed to help God's people. You're supposed, the poor you will always have with you, you are supposed to alleviate the suffering of people and behave to them as if you were God. That's why prosperous companies run orphanages and, and, and give scholarships and things like this. Because if every Christian business, how many Christian business, you Christian men, you know here, that you start a similar business with a non-Christian. The non-Christian is given permission and your business is seen problem after problem. There is a ruler. All this Freemasonry is edicts that were being made by men over the financial prosperity yes. of people. Yes. So they, they, they was, you remember that guy Demetrius in Acts? He, he was a ruler of darkness and he was busy forging images of Diana. And Paul came and he said, and he cast the spirit out. And they said, oh, 
Brothers, you know how we have made a fortune and financed our demonic gospel with this trade. And Paul now has come. He's opening a new business. He's opening a new business. These guys are trying to open things that are going to fund the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you organize an uprising against them. You don't just go and say, Understand the spirit yes. that has been supervising yes. fast food industry in Zimbabwe. Yeah. Understand the spirit that has been supervising insurance, that has been supervising banking, that has been supervising real estate. Because that spirit is jealous that the money comes to them and they can fund. There's rulers of darkness over music. Are you with me? You look carefully. In every season, there's always one person that is so elevated in the music or acting or, 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 or showbiz that all our children, all our children want to be like that person. All our children know that person. And that person has an incredible amount of money. Incredible. Can't understand how they made it. That money is made simply to fund the gospel of Satan. And so we, we Christians, we must be strategic. Yes. Right. Now it's, yes. you know, and it changes. It was showbiz. Watch gaming now. I want to just tell you, young people, watch gaming now. There's a ruler of darkness coming there. We were watching a TV show, my wife and I, the other day, and five girls killed themselves in an exit game. It's called an exit game. They killed themselves. There is control over areas. It's not starting a new political party. It's not taking to the streets. It's not, they, they may be strategies and allow the world to express themselves. But as BCC and as Christians, we must come strategically. Strategically. Mwari. Lord, who has been in control here? I want him out. How? Not who physically. Don't, that's why witchcraft kills physical people. They don't understand that it's up here. And so, God, I want to, to look at what's happening to the health sector. Oh, we're going to go and do this. We're going to know. Christians must come together and say, God, give us a strategy. Yes. I'm going to tell you, in West Africa, several years ago, there was a ruler of darkness spirit operating through a certain leader. And international intercessors were told by God to pray with fasting for 160 days. God is prescriptive to move the spirit. And they started to pray. On the 160th day, while drinking tea, I'm not saying you pray for people to come to harm. I'm saying, God, what is happening yeah. over Zimbabwe? What is this prince of Zimbabwe? What is this prince of Harare? What is it? And we come here and yes. we get a God-given strategy. Yes. And we exercise and execute yes. that mandate to the T. Amen. And go seven times yeah. and shout on the seventh yes. time. <laughs> we will not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers, rulers and controllers in the atmosphere. And God is going to help. I pray this week that this auditorium would be full like this. Because one of the things that I'm going to ask the pastors to do this week is that we pray in a domain. Say those that are in media, those that are in the arts, those that are in business, those that are in health, those that are in government, those that are in education, 
those that look over family and counseling and ministry, that we pray and say, God, what would you have us do? Because by this time, next year, by this time, next year, it's only the 4th of February that we're going to. God must give us a workable strategy to enforce what he has secured in heaven. Let's stand.